Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to The Ardent Wife. We're so, so grateful to be back with you guys. And today we have a special treat. We're going to be talking about parenting styles and what does that look like in marriage. So I'm super curious. Um, Tiffany, tell us a little bit about your parenting style and Chris's parenting style. And what is that like in your <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I'll probably get in trouble for this, but um, I would say we are a lot different. I always, Reese, I teased Chris. We say he have a popping spirit <laughs> 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 because it takes a lot for me to pop. You know, I was like, let's just talk about this. Let's calm down. But Chris is like, and I feel like... um. Yeah, it's I, I say I have more patience than he does. Like I'm not fighting with her. I'm more of a talker and a pop is the last resort. He is more of a pop first and talk about it later. <laughs> yeah, that's where we stand over here. What about you, D? It's funny you say that because I think when they were little, Ed had a pop in spirit too. <laughs> but and I think that's just because of the way he was raised. Like, I believe, you know, that's how he was disciplined. But I feel like and that's more with my middle one. And when she was little, she was a handful. <laughs> she was a lot, very impulsive. Um, and it, for me, I'm much more patient with him. But I, well, I can't say that. That's not true. Let, let me not be phony. Okay. It depends on the child for me. So my mm -hmm. oldest one... Kaya, I love her to death. And I will never forget, I took her to the pediatrician. And like I used, I love my pediatrician when we lived in Massachusetts. She, Dr. Serino, she was amazing. And she told me that some children have a direct correlation between their heads and their butts. And Kaya is that child. So I can talk to her. I would rationalize, but the last like thing would be like, okay, you're going to, we call it pow pow. You're going to get a pow pow. And for if you said that, she'd be like, okay. I'm going to listen now. <laughs> Layla, if you put her in timeout, which is like corporal punishment, that's like the equivalent of a pow pow for her. Like she'll lose her mind, like just for her to sit still for two or three minutes at the time. And now that Mila's so much younger and we're just so seasoned, we give her so much more grace than we give the other children. And so I think it depends on the child for us, but our parenting styles are so different. Like my husband's all about talking and just his personality. He sees both sides of the story, which is very frustrating for me. Cause I'm like, there's one side to the story and it's my side. And so like, he can be very gracious and they're girls. And so he's very, um, he, he's just, just the way he talks to them and communicates with them. I think if we had boys, he would have a pop in spirit for sure. Um, I think he'd be harder on them, but I think because they're girls and they're daddy's little girls, all three of them are daddy's little girls. He's really gracious with them. And for me, I'm like, mm -mm, no girlfriend, like it ain't, it ain't flowing. So I'm the disciplinarian in our house. I'm the, the, a little bit harder than he is. What about you, Jen? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I agree from from us too. It's really has depended. We've had to learn our children. And mm -hmm. I think now we're in a season with the 26 year old that we're still navigating that parenting style. And honestly, he was the hardest. And I think part of that is because when we got married, he was six and my husband and I had very different, like I grew up no discipline, like rarely, like I did not really get in trouble not because I didn't do anything wrong, but because my parents were really unavailable to discipline me. So I was more lax and he comes from a West Indian family and the belt. And, you know, it was like, you didn't talk back. And I'm like, oh, I want to hear what he has to say. And so that was definitely a challenge, you know, um, and, and navigating that of like, what does that look like? And, and, and for me, letting go, I was his mom six years, you know, and, and I took care of him. So I think allowing him to step in, that's probably a whole other conversation. But I think definitely he was more, but, I, you know, 19 years in, I've seen the growth as we're navigating with our teens right now. And he definitely is the one as a therapist, too, that can lean in and listen and hear what they have to say and um and I think it depends on the moment when things happen too, right? Like if we're caught off guard, if we're busy, 
Um, I think we strive to try to have this collaborative problem solving way with our children, but I definitely am more relaxed and he grew up like, no, you're okay. You know, you're going to be all right. And, and he's learning though. He's learning maybe how that wasn't so great. And I'm learning how sometimes you just got to lay down the law. Right. And I also feel like I know me coming back to Christ has a huge, had a huge effect on my parenting. Mm -hmm. Um, And just the more that I abide and I go into the word that definitely giving them grace, giving them patience, forgiving forgiveness. Um, And I came from a military home and just discipline. The way I discipline my children is totally different than the way I was disciplined. So when I was a kid, the way that my parents disciplined us, um, when my parents got together, because I was I was raised in a blended family as well. Um, so I was with my mom, single mom, who she would pop me often, especially if her nerves were short at the time. I often had a backhand. <laughs> I'll remember like, you know, trying not to catch it. <laughs> and then when they got married, um, I think them coming together, my dad was Navy. And so he would use exercise as punishment, which... <laughs> backfired now because out of the six of us, I'd say three of us are morbidly obese. Um, and three of us aren't my youngest brother isn't because he wasn't disciplined that way. Cause they were just tired by that time. Like by the time we were raising him, they just kind of let him do what he wanted. And then for me, I had a relationship with exercise as it was a form of punishment. So, but that's a whole nother episode and story of how I overcame that. But that was definitely Jesus. And then my other brother, he recently just lost 80 pounds because he was diagnosed with type two diabetes at 27. And he just feared for his health and his life. And so the discipline, I would never make my kids hold a plank pose or sit in a wall sit or do push ups until their arms gave out because that's how I was punished. And so it's just trying to rewrite the things that we didn't think were right when we were being raised. And then also just trying to come together in that parenting aspect. I feel like it's something in 19 years that we've had to navigate and it's just taken time. And it's the child, honestly, because like I said, Kaya, a swip pop sometimes is necessary for her just to get it together. Um, But Layla, I can sit down and talk it out and she just has so much empathy. Like she's just taking it like, Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, And then Mila, Again, we're which that poor girl. She she's our third one, and there's an eight year gap. So it's just kind of like we're just grateful that she's doing her thing. So yeah, I think it's all depends on the child, like you said. Yeah. So what advice would you guys give people that are navigating parenting differences in their marriage? Like, what has helped you guys in your marriage navigating those differences? Any principles? Any tips? You have to be a united front. Cause they will play on that for sure. They know if I can go to dad for this and I can go to mom for that kids. That's just what they do. They test your boundaries and they try to figure out who. So I know sometimes we have to convene before we discipline versus being reactive. So I, my first, I would say is to be reflective before you're reactive. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, like you said, it depends on the situation because sometimes you need to react for their safety. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, if you can, just convening together and then figure out what you're going to do and then approaching the child, I feel like has helped us kind of be on a united front. Yeah. Yes. And I would say that, too, because that is important. Even Reese at four, she knows, right? She can ask mommy for something. She can ask daddy for something. <laughs> you know, she, yeah. daddy says no, then I can go ask mom. So it's good, like you said, to have that united for it. And so I have to say, well, what did daddy say? <laughs> you know, but also in Also, like D, you mentioned a little bit before about going back to the Bible. And so I was sitting here looking for this scripture because the scripture came to mind to me in um, Matthew. It's Matthew 20 verses. I'll start at verse 25, but just a little bit of context in this is that uh, at this time, Zebedee's, the mother of Zebedee's sons come and they ask Jesus. She's asking Jesus, um, Grant that one of these of my two sons may sit at the right and the other at your left in your kingdom. And that's in verse 
chapter Matthew ver, chapter 20 verse 21. And so she's asking, you know, Jesus, can her sons have these places of leadership? And so Jesus responds down in verse 25 when he called him together and he says to them, "You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you." He's talking to his disciples and we are his disciples, right? Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so for me, like sometimes when you think about leadership, you don't think of your leadership as being a mother right? As a parent, like we are leaders of our children and we don't just want to hoard it over them. I'm sure you've all heard because I said so, you know, and so your children now, now, now they don't have a voice, but we are to lead in such a way, like I'm here to serve you. And I know that's, <laughs> you know, we don't look at that in our children, but really though, we are serving them in that we are there to nurture their hearts. It's not so much as to don't do this and don't do that, but we are there to shepherd their hearts and in shepherding their hearts. Sometimes as parents, we have to take that seat of humility. And so I often tell Chris, it's like, okay, let's see what the word says about this. You know, how is it that we are to, how is it that we are to parent? And, um, you know, there's nothing specifically in the Bible that says, hey, as a parent, thou shall do this and thou shall not do this. But you can kind of read the text and see how to lead. Like, how do I lead? And you can take that into your home and say, OK, well, we're going to lead this way. I'm not going to hoard it over her because I can make her do whatever I wanted her to do. But I don't think the goal is to raise children who are necessarily soldiers like you know almost yeah. like they become robots you know programmed to oh i'm just doing what you tell me to do it's like you take away i believe that creative piece in them and that ability to function and to make their own decisions what's going to serve them well when they get outside of the home so i like to chat like let's just talk about this let's just take a step back and you and most times you can learn something from them you know it perhaps it's something that I don't know, you know, instead of jumping to conclusions, I always tell Chris, like, because I said earlier, right, he pops first. Okay, let's hold off on the popping. Let's just see. Let's just take a beat <laughs> and let's just hear what she has to say, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. It's like loving like Jesus. Absolutely. And I feel like um, something that I learned, I want to say it's Tim Keller and he has a parent. Tim Keller is an amazing things on marriage and parenting and all those things. But I feel like um, loving like Jesus and just setting an example, because our kids will not do what we say, but they will mimic our actions. And so they are always observing and they're always watching us. And that was something that he was saying, like, you can't be hypocritical. You can't say something and not do that, that thing. And so I feel like for me, that's, that's how it changed my parenting is I want to love like Jesus. So my actions need to speak life, speak, be loving, um, be like nurturing, like you were saying in them versus just disciplining them and making them do what I want them to do. And so that has definitely affected how I parent. Now, Jen, you said that your oldest son came into your, he was six when you started, when you got married to Rondi. So how was that like navigating having another child and or having a child already and then blending the family together. Yeah, I think, um, gosh, it, it's been a journey for sure. And I think I, one thing I really have appreciated about my husband, he has loved my son. Like I, I feel like from the beginning, you know, even when we were dating, he went to his parent teacher conferences when we, like when we were first like saying, okay, this is probably going to be serious. Um, and I, can really honestly say, and I feel blessed because I don't, you know, this might not be everybody's story, but that he really took him in, you know, as his. And, and so that was a good foundation that I feel like we did have. And, 
you know, he went out to eat with his father before we got married and they had a conversation. He's like, hey, man, I'm going to respect you. And so he did that kind of foundational work, which was really good. Um, and at one point we were like, OK, what are you going to call him? Right. You're going to call him Rondi. You're going to call him Pop. You're going to call and, they, and he decided to call him dad. And we asked his dad if that was OK. And he said yes. Now, he later regretted that, but um, and had or had feelings around it, I guess I would say. Um but I think that that's been really helpful. However, because we had such different parenting styles, it it definitely caused some rifts and some arguments. And we had to work it through, you know, of like, I was feeling afraid or I, you know, how do you, why are you talking to him like that? You know, the tone or things that I wasn't used to and try, it had to, for me, I had to trust his heart. Okay. I know he loves him. I know he cares for him. And I can, I can still share what I'm feeling and thinking, right? Kind of like you said, Tiffany, whoa, wait a minute, hold on. And, and even for me, that was a growth place for me more than even, I mean, it, it affects our kids too, but it was like, okay, wait a minute. We got to be that united front. I got to trust him. Um, and that surrender, that control, I think there was a lot of that, you know, the first few years that we were together. And I will have to say, Jan, um, growing up, in a blended family where well, I had a stepfather to come in, I would say my mom, I don't know, you know, like you're saying, you have to trust him. And I don't know if my mom did ever did when it came to discipline, because her thing was I'll discipline my own children. So it's like, he never discipline us. Mm. That was on her. Now, I do believe now, and she, when she listens to this, she's probably going to kill me, but I do think now she regrets that, right? Because it becomes a point where you need that male authority to speak. It's different, right? Yeah. And But yeah. that's not the way the foundation has been laid all these years. So it's now you, you can't go back and change that. So like he, I mean, literally never put us on punishment, nothing. She was like, I would discipline my own children. And I think it's some of this belief, like you were saying that, I don't know that some women maybe have like this man is not going to love my children the way that I love my children or this belief, you know, that now I have to protect them. But I think, you know, when you are in a Christ centered marriage, then it's like, I'm trusting the Christ in you. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit in you. So you know that there's a capacity, regardless of what the world says, that this man can love your children like his own. Yeah, I think you made such a good point that they they need both voices. They need both of our parenting styles. Yes, we need to be unified, but my sons need their father. And they also need me as their mother. And they need, and this is, you know, the fabric of family, right, is marriage. And even why we're doing a lot of this, right? Like, hold on, hold out, get through these times, even in your marriage, because this, this foundational piece of my kids need his voice, they need to be with him in the mundane, and, and they need my voice, too, is just really, really powerful. Yeah. So I was raised in a blended family as well. I was the oldest of six and my dad had brought in five and then my mom had uh, no four. And then my little brother was our, he, we say he's the connector because he's both of our half brothers and we never did step half or anything like that. Um, I called my biological dad, daddy. I called my stepdad, dad. I consider my stepdad more of my father than my biological father. And so he was a disciplinarian in our house and, it was immediate. Like when they got married, it was like, okay, this is your dad now. And you're going to call him dad. And there was really none of that, um, negotiate or that explanation or negotiation when it came to being raised that way. And I, I, like I said, I do remember, I remember the single times with my mom. And I remember once I came into that family unit and you're right, the both, that's why we're supposed to have the mom and the dad because they have their different energies, even in raising daughters, like yeah. seeing a man and seeing how um, he's respected in his house, how he is the fidelity of his house, how he rules his house is very important. And I definitely think it's formed some of my desire in my own husband um, mm -hmm. and what I was looking for in a husband as well. And so, yeah, it, I feel like it doesn't matter how the family is 
created, right? The foundation has to be Jesus in order for there to be love and nurture in that, in that, and what's interesting, something we've learned recently is as they get older, right? We know kids don't have a prefrontal cortex. They don't think clearly, right? And so as they're younger, Tiffany, I love the book, Shepherding a Child's Heart. You said that term, right? Shepherding a Child's Heart. When they're younger, it's like, I want you to learn to listen, listen quickly and listen with a good attitude. Those were like the three things we wanted to teach our kids when they were younger, because it was about keeping them safe. And now as they go through different stages and they're trying to find their identity, us letting go and letting them find themselves and letting them like have times where we can talk it through. Cause as we're talking it through, they don't think things through. So we get to in a calm, safe place, think things through with them. We get to be their free frontal, free frontal cortex. We get to help them think clearly through things. Oh, well, what could happen if you did that? And well, what made you feel that way? And really have those conversations. It's shifted, right? Mm -hmm. In this continuum of where things are at. And, and so it's been a joy, right? But it's definitely a lot of letting go, a lot of surrender of, especially as they're aging. And I think it's, you know, like you and Dee have children that are much older, right? So I have a four-year-old. And so it's still kind of in those early stages where I feel like, Lord, I just soak in this time. Because if I tell her something, you know, she's one to where um, I can just look at her. And she just like, she just breaks down, <laughs> you know, because she don't want to disappoint mommy. And so I'm like, Reese, you're not doing the right thing. And she's like, but I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to do the right thing. Mom, look at me. I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> I was like, you Paul, are right. <laughs> yes. Like, Paul, I don't, I don't know why I do the wrong thing. I want to do it. Right. <laughs> I said, okay, well, let's try again. And so <laughs> she's like, and so I just love, and I'm like, I can tell her it's eight. I'm like, Reese, it's time for bed. It's like, okay. <laughs> I mean, like, great. I'm like, but I know, like you all are saying, like, it's a season, right? I'm teaching. Um, but I think the constant in it is that, you know, you've set the foundation of the parenting and like you have that relationship with your children. And so you're just continuing to build upon that, you know. And that's where I do value, Edward, seeing both sides, especially in this teenage stage, mm -hmm. because for yeah. me, I'm like black and white and he will talk it through with them. He's also a great girl's dad. Like they are, they're like, yeah. And he's like, okay, let's talk about this. Meanwhile, I'm like, yeah, with them. So it's like, I, we need that to balance each other out. And sometimes he just like, D, I got this. Like, let me work this because you're too in emotionally involved in it or whatever the case may be. Um, and so the parenting, the differences are good in that aspect. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we have to unite and be on the same type of parenting too. So I don't ever want to, like, those are his daughters. I don't ever want to, um, what's the word? I just don't want to mute his Dis voice yeah, or disrespect him yeah. and his, like who he is because mm -hmm. he's their father. Um, so that that happens behind closed doors. I would never do that in front of the girls. Um, but yeah, I do. Sometimes the parenting differences are great. And then sometimes they can be a little frustrating when you're in the heat of the teenage girl moment. <laughs> and I, you know, I do just want to give a shout out there to single moms being a single mom, y'all that are raising a child you know, with the, on your own, you're being the mommy, you're being the daddy, you're working hard out there. Listen, I feel like God has a special grace for you. He has a special grace um, for you. And so I just want to give a shout out to them. And if you all can, right, this is where I think the church is so helpful. When I, you know, when Isaiah was younger and I just became a Christian, I remember having a mentor. We actually got to see him on our anniversary trip this weekend, or a guy that was like a mentor to Isaiah, you know, who was in there with him. And, you know, when I first became a Christian, I, and again, I didn't have any discipline. He's like, you, he cannot speak to you that way. He cannot hit you, you know, and he, you know, mm. pre being married and just having single brothers in my life, helping me. Um, and I feel blessed by that, but just so those single mamas out there, you know, there's a grace for that. And, um, and you're doing a good job. For sure. My husband was raised by a single woman and he, there's several men in his life that he attributes to the man that he is today. And it was from the church and his mom was very, um, she made sure that she set those 
those mentorships up um, so that he could grow because there's certain things that you just can't do um, as a single mom. And it's hard. It's hard. Um, I raised partially with a single mom. You just do the best that you can do every single day. And I love that you, you said there's grace for that space. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. And so I was just sitting here thinking, you know, because in the world and the culture that we live in, you kind of get this viewpoint is that I don't need a man. Like I, you know, I'm the mama and the daddy, right? Mm -hmm. So from a Christian's point of view, what do you think about that mindset or what, what does the Bible say about that mindset? <laughs> like breathe. <sighs> <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know what the word says about that. Well, I think about Ecclesiastics when, you know, two, three, two, I'm, I'm going to botch it. So, you know, it's that like three, <laughs> right. Yes. Because, because if someone falls down, they have someone to help you up. And a cord of street thrands is not easily, easily broken. And yes. so, you know, I think that, that we do, and he created both male and female created his image and we do need each other. I, we do. And I think that's why this message is so key. I love that you asked that Tiffany, because we do need each other. And I think that comes from a, a broken place, a hurt mm. place, a vulnerable place. And that mm. is like a shield of, I don't need anybody because I've been yeah. hurt. And, yeah, and I think good, that, yeah. that we do, we need each other. I need you guys. You need me, right? We're yeah. all a part of the body. Yeah. And so God, and God designed us differently and we do need each other. And we have roles. He's given us roles. We've talked about that. We have certain roles that we play and it is incomplete without that. Now, yeah. if you're a single parent, like, again, I really believe there's a grace for that and God will have to make up for it. But if, if it's just like, I don't want, I don't need anybody. That's a, that's a broken place. And, and I think there may be need some healing there. Mm -hmm. And that also made me think of surrendering too because that, and that takes trust, right? And so you need to be in that community where there's people you can trust so that you can surrender. And so definitely places of healing, places of community is needed, um, which is all biblical. And we know Jesus, Holy Spirit, and God, they all hung out together in community. And so they set the example of how we are supposed to, and we are walking his image. And so you're looking for a biblical context, then I would say the Trinity <laughs> would be a great yeah. example. And then surrender and submission um, is definitely biblical and hard, hard to actually live that out because that's putting your pride to the side, also putting your unbelief to the side, which is our sin, like our sinful nature often. Um, but with intention can help and will help you. And I feel also with that, I can do it all by myself. It's hard. And so when you do find those people that you can trust and you relinquish some of that and you feel the release of that, it makes you able to do it a little bit more and more as you grow. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you look in the Bible and you look at the heart and the intention behind family, like God's intent, you know, was for there to be a husband, a wife, and then they create, right? And that, that marriage unit is until death do you part. Right. And then when you look at we talked a little bit about a previous episode about Ephesians five and it talks about, you know, the wife submitting to her husband and respecting her husband and the husband loving his wife and the wife. Right. Um, the husband being the head of the wife and then Christ them being ahead of the husband. So there is an order, right? <laughs> you know, with Christ being the head of all. And so I think when we, I think in the culture that we live in, we've, we have created our own rules <laughs> and we forget like this world does not belong to us. Like there is a creator of all of us and everything that's in it, the institution of family, the institution of marriage, and who are we to decide how to use a creator's creation, right? It's like, if you have a toothbrush, you know, who am I? I mean, I could use the toothbrush to wash my car, right? But it probably won't be as effective or as beneficial. So it's like, you have to go back to the creator and find out the intent. What did I, he intend God creator when he instituted all these things. And so we don't get to make up 
you know, we don't get to say, I mean, you can, but it's just going to be hard. <laughs> you know, it's like, do you, until you finally surrender to the way, the, the plan that he had, the perfect plan that he's orchestrated, then you face resistance and um, hardship and who has time for that? <laughs> you know? Hey everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode on blended families. And we know that that can look really different for everyone. And we're excited to be able to jump into these conversations with you, share our stories and share any wisdom that we've gained. And so first, we would love if you've not subscribed to our podcast yet, please hit subscribe. That way you'll get a notification when a new episode comes. And it also helps us to get the word out and share the information. So if you're enjoying it, go ahead and hit subscribe. And if you are a part of the Ardent Wives Club, we're going to be dropping an assessment here that goes along with this uh, episode. And so there are four parenting styles that we're going to be kind of looking at ourselves with. And that's a permissive, indifferent, permissive, indulgent, authoritative, and authoritarian. And you're going to be able to just answer some quick questions. It won't take you long to figure out what is your parenting style and isn't it good that we get to learn about ourselves and grow together? So if you're not in the Art of Wives Club, head over to Facebook and join our group. And we look forward to just continuing to do life with you guys. We pray this is blessing you and we love you. We'll see you soon. Yeah. And that's it, y'all. That is it. I mean, I love it because this is what we're trying to do here, right? We're trying to live out what God has put in order and we're trying to do it with faith, trust and surrender. So we pray that this time has blessed you or maybe given you a few things to think about um, as you think about your parenting styles, as you think about marriage in that. And um, we look forward to continue to grow, laugh um, and cry together and obviously just grow closer to Jesus. You guys, we're in it with you and we look forward to talking to you next time.